that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. So lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Energy Week with George Harvey and the famous Tom Fennell. In the flesh. In the flesh. And um, I will repeat for what what I always say at the beginning of the show. Every day I get up and I go through the news looking for um, uh, items, news items on energy and uh, climate change. And when I find something that I think is interesting, I do a 50-word synopsis. If I'm lucky, it's just to copy the first paragraph of the story <laughs> and tie that to a to a link and put it in a post that goes up. I put post 10 to 15 of these things every day, and um, that that is at my blog called geoharvey.com or geoharvey.wordpress.com. It'll work either way. And more and more of them are having pictures attached. Oh, Some of the well, pictures are well worth looking at. Yeah, I've been I've been doing pictures for over a year now, and uh, I try to have an I try to have a, a ratio of. Um, of our articles to pictures, so I've got uh, one picture for every other article. Is that the way it works? Yeah, I, I try to. It, I think it. I think it looks good on a page. If you have more than three articles, it it spreads the pictures out too much. In the early days, early days, starting about four years ago, I didn't have pictures for a long time. Yeah, I was finding pictures <clears throat> for you. Yeah, t Tom was finding pictures for the for the show. And uh, I, I wanted to make things easy, so I'd, I'd pick up pictures that were available on the... Um, They're usually on the website. On the website. They come from the articles themselves. Usually, yeah. In most cases. Yeah. If, if I don't have enough pictures, I go to Wikimedia Commons and get stuff there. Usually it has something to do with the story. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the story. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I put up pictures just because they're pretty. But anyway... Um, we're going to start with something pretty today, and that is, um, I should mention that, that today's show starts with news that, um, that appeared uh, at, on my blog on September 8th, and as I go through this, if you go to geoharvey.com, you can click on a calendar that appears there. If you want to find the full story, um, you can click on the calendar and then look through the stories that uh, appear for that date. This is a story from The Guardian. Beauty and power. How Norway is making green energy look good. Now let me get that picture up. Yeah, let's do that. There we go. On the edge of a forest in northern Norway, an unusual hydroelectric plant is creating a buzz. Ovre Forsland, and that's probably pronounced very badly. It's, I don't, well, I looked it up. Yeah? I listened to a, a Norwegian pronounce it. Okay. Ovre. Ovre Forsland. <laughs> okay, is a big departure from the hulking power stations. It looks more like an elegant custom-built home from the TV show Grand Designs. There is a picture of there, it. There it is. Now, this, this is a place I recommend that you guys Google Erver Forsland. And okay. a half a dozen, more than that, websites are going to come up. And of the first six, six of them have slideshows on there. <laughs> and this is a very beautiful part of a very beautiful country. Right. And the slideshows are well worth looking at. Yep. And you see different views of this power station. And it fits right into the decor. It fits right into the mountains. Right. In the daytime, it doesn't look like a big, ugly power station like you yep. might see on a Connecticut River. At night, you see it. It's got interesting uh, lighting effects. Yep. And it has actually become a tourist attraction. <laughs> well, you know, we have a power station just down the river from us that's kind of pretty. That's the one I think I mentioned, the, the one in Inverna? No, no, no. Oh. No, the Northfield Mountain Station. Oh, that is, yeah, that's right. It's yeah. very that's pretty. That's a, diff different, it's a yeah, different, different kind, kind of thing. thing. It's a park, and its output is just double the out, what the output was at the, when it was commissioned of the Vermont Yankee plant. That's a pumped storage plant, which can store power from... From quite a bit. Quite a bit, yeah, yeah, from wind or solar. Okay. Well, on the edge of the floor, you're going to read about this. Or did you already? What's that? On the edge of a forest in northern Norway. Did I did. You, did I you did. Read that? I read it. Duh. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me mention a couple of quick things here. Okay. First of all, it's a very small hydro plant. 
Yeah, you okay. can kind of get that when you look at it. It's, it's three megawatts. Yeah. And the one down in Vernon is 34 megawatts. Yep. Okay, so it's small. Yep. It also incorporates storage, which the one in Vernon doesn't. Yes. It's got battery storage. And this, this came from the article. It's the perfect place. The environment is fantastic. The region is known for its spectacular nature. So we thought the building should l try to live up to the surroundings. That was done by, that was the architect talking. Yeah. He did a good job. He did a good job. Yeah. And from the article also, the station benefits from a 500 foot drop in a Forceland River. 500 wow. feet. Wow. And it drives two turbines. Wow. So it's a small stream, but it's, it's amazing how much how much power you can get out of a relatively small turbine if you've got a well, if you got big a five hundred foot drop, you yeah. got, you have something there to talk about. Yep. So again, I mentioned if you guys want to want to be, uh, if you want to enjoy some pictures, visit one of those sites and look at the slideshow. Yep, it's absolutely. well worth doing. Absolutely. Okay, our next item is from Energy Matters. 15 signals of the unstoppable energy transition. <laughs> that is, this is an important article. It is. This is a good It is one. unstoppable. Yeah, it is. And it's not because and of the And we're going to see thinking. more of that. We're going to see, in this, in this show, we're going to see more of exactly that. The message is getting out. Yeah, it is. A new it's, 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 eco it's an economic message. It is. A new report highlights 15 signals of an energy transition occurring across the world, indicating a sustainable and equitable energy, equitable, notice that word, global energy system has irrevo irrevocably begun. The signs detailed in a report by WWF France and WWF China provide encouragement that the transition can be found just about everywhere. And that's the World Wrestling Federation, right? I think it is, yes. <laughs> it's actually the World Wildlife Fund. Well, I got some of the signals here, which I'll touch base on real Good quick. Good idea. Re renewables accounted for 90% of new generation globally last year. 90%. The year before, it was 50%. Yeah. Okay. Solar PV electricity mm. costs have plummeted more than 80% yep. since 2009 yep. and are continue, expected to continue to fall. Right. Global investments in renewable-based generation reach a new world record in 2015. Now, these are all happenings, okay? Yeah. Renewable energy employment attained a record high in 2015 with 8 million jobs. 8 now, million that's, jobs. That's worldwide, but that's yeah, a lot of jobs. That's a lot of jobs. Solar power was the largest sector. For jobs? For or jobs. For, okay. Yep. More than 170 large companies, including energy-intensive firms, have signed on to adopt science-based emissions targets. Good idea. Okay. Uh, China ha may have already reached a coal consumption peak, and globally, coal faces declining prices and higher costs. Yes, So coal indeed. is getting to be much less of an option. There we go. Back, back to me. <laughs> back to you. <laughs> I, I'll, put, I'll put me up there since I'm doing the talk. Yeah, I do that. I'll talk, put us both up. Oh, there you go. Okay, global energy-related carbon emissions stagnated for the second year in a row. Now, that's good news. Yes. Uh, despite, despite economic growth. Yes. Okay. So, th this is something that has been said many times in the last few months, but economic growth is no longer tied to carbon emissions. No, and it has been for a hundred years. Yeah. You know, so in order yeah. to grow in the past, we had to yep, burn yep. more coal or burn so more we've, oil. We've, we've broken that next. We've state. broken that, yes. And the last one that I have is not the last of the 15, but projections versus reality show international agencies have underestimated the potential of renewable energy technologies. Fairly consistently. Fairly, well, yeah. we've talked about that. Yes, really. we have. The, one of the things that I, I always say is, <clears throat> the the uh, Energy Information Administration, which is part of the DOE, but they're always wrong. Advises Congress <laughs> if they're if they're making a projection that something will happen in renewable energy in 25 years, it, it happens it the happened, following right? year. <laughs> if they make a projection that they made a projection um, this year that coal uh, production would remain flat for the next five years, 
So they're saying that coal would be 33% of the, yeah, of the uh, of would the provide 33% of our electricity yeah. for the next five years, yeah, roughly. Did happen. And within <laughs> two months, the DOE was saying coal production had declined to 25%. That's a big difference, 33 versus 25. Well, are they really talking science or are they talking politics? I, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> sure they know what they're doing, but it, they, you know, the, my lesson out of that is don't trust anything that the that the EIA says, even though they are commissioned to to advise Congress. Yeah, yeah. And the second, th you know, basically what I've been doing, what doing this blog for years, five almost five years now. Um, one thing that I have noticed is there is one group of people you can count on to be fairly close to the mark most of the time, and that is the people whose job is to advise investors. Bingo. I was thinking Bloomberg. You know, Bloomberg is yeah, one. Yeah, um, I was thinking just exactly and, that. And I see them come up with projections in the following year. The projections turn out to be pr pretty close. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, these other ones... Well, it's, it's a different objective. They're, they're not talking about politics. They're talking to their clientele. Yes. And if they're on the mark, they're going to keep that clientele. And if they aren't on the mark, they're out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> So that's an important incentive to there's, be active. There's an important takeaway <clears throat> from this. Now, yes. we've, we've mentioned certainly this before, but I'm going to read it again. Yeah. It looks as though 2016 will go down in the record books as the hottest year ever recorded. Yes. It's a reminder that we have precious little time left to act to keep global you know, temperatures below 2C. If I could, if I could mention something here. There's, there you is, can. I'll give you there, permission. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> there, there is still debate about, about uh, climate change. And it happens I'm that not sure it's the, base. the number of people who believe that climate change is a hoax is increasing in, among Republicans. Yeah. All right. <laughs> because they've got a party that's telling them that it's a hoax. Yeah. All right. I want to ask people, how many people out there in, you know, here we are in, in, the, in Wyndham County, Vermont. How many people out there in Wyndham County or across the river in, in Cheshire County um, uh, are are completely unconcerned about Lyme disease. They'll go out in in, in the fields and uh, tromp around, go on a hike, whatever, and come back and not even not even check themselves to see if they have ticks. How many people are so unconcerned about about Which, Lyme disease? I don't know the answer to that, but it's certainly declining. Yeah. So when I was a kid, and I I lived just across the river, about seven miles from Brattleboro. Um, we ran around in woods and fields all summer long, barefoot, you know, wearing shorts, and we never worried about ticks. There weren't any yeah. ticks. There were no ticks. Yeah. <laughs> and the ticks didn't appear until my kids were young. But now that's people a, have That's got, about right. The ticks started to appear when your kids were young. About 1980. Yeah. My sister got Lyme disease when she started having kids. I mean, uh. it's, that's just a coincidence. I don't yeah. think the kids had anything to do with well, it. Well, yeah, but she was probably chasing after the kids. Probably, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, those ticks weren't here because the winters were too the cold. The winters were killing them. Now the winters are not too cold, yeah. and the ticks survive. And if they're, you've they're, had Lyme they're disease... They're attacking moose. They're attacking moose. They're killing, killing moose. Killing moose. If you, and the moose get Lyme disease, too. And if you've got, had Lyme disease, or if you have a family member who has Lyme disease, or you've paid for Lyme disease, or you pay medical insurance, or you pay taxes, you know. Costs. <clears throat> there's a cost to it. There, there's a cost, and you can thank climate change for that, because it's driven by climate change. I think the evidence supports that. I think, statement. you know, I've talked to scientists at the World Wildlife Fund who, you know, I've said, and they, they say, well, we can't prove that it's exactly that, you know, that, but that's what scientists believe. And the scientists, the 99.9% plus of scientists who are into uh, climatology and meteorology believe in climate change. As a matter of fact, MSNBC did a survey of scientists to find out how many don't believe in human-caused climate change, and out of 70,000 um, scientists, they found four, four, not 4,000, four. And I, you know, when that happened, I thought at that time we had 12 
presidential candidates running in the Republican Party for nomination who are climate deniers, if you'd taken all the presidential candidates who are climate deniers and all the climatologists who are cl climate deniers and put them into a room, 80% <laughs> of them would have been politicians. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, we should go ahead. Yeah, let's okay. take, a, take a look at a picture of a nice beach. A nice beach. Yeah. Is that what that is? Well, it's not. <laughs> Let me get okay. it Okay, this is, this is a, an item that comes from the Carbon Brief. So, what, you Yeah, I, I first looked at this. I thought, I thought it was a beach. And I said, what's all those things in the beach? <laughs> and it turns out it's a parking lot. They're cars and trucks. They're cars and trucks. That's not a beach. It's <clears> a flooded parking lot. Yeah. And those fields in the background aren't fish farms. They're like corn farms. That's right. And this is Baton yeah. Rouge. Yeah, it's Baton After Rouge. a tremendous rainstorm. Yep. So what's the title of this let's, article? Let's get this from one From Carbon up. Brief. Climate change doubles the chances of Louisiana's heavy rains. The, the scientists are starting to look at probabilities here and, and so forth. Cl torrential rains unleashed in South Louisiana in August were made almost twice as likely by human-caused climate change, according to quick fire analysis. A team of scientists concluded that the likelihood of such an event is probably twice as great now as in 1900, but at least 40% more likely. And I want to point out that um, picture that we had showing that beach sure in is, Baton yeah. Rouge. Yeah, up again. Bat Baton Rouge means red stick, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it <laughs> does, yeah. That, that uh, <laughs> mess that's down there was because of a rainstorm that dumped 33 and a half inches of, ra of rain. Hurricane Katrina dumped 12. I think I have This was here. 33 and a half inches. They got inches. 20 inches in three days, they got 33 in a week. Amazing. And that storm did not form over the Gulf. It was powered by by uh, moisture from the Gulf, but it, 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 it wasn't a hurricane. It was not a hurricane. It was an ordinary storm. Really. This was what's called a, a mesoscale, uh, um, um, what's the word? You know it, Tom, of course, you know what I'm thinking. <laughs> convective system, a mesoscale convective system. I read system. that, but I went in one eye and out the other. Yeah, I'm sure it did. Let, and, me, let me read a little bit about oh, what okay, happened. Okay, go ahead. This came from the website. Yep. As the slow-moving storm crept west, now storms usually creep east, but this That's one right. crept west. Yes. It sucked up tremendous amounts of tropical moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, the Gulf of Mexico had a lot more moisture over it because the Gulf was hotter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Downpours increased as the storm moved closer to Louisiana. The unnamed storm would eventually shower Louisiana with an estimated, now are you ready for this number? 7.1 trillion gallons of water. You know, most people can imagine things of five because that's the number of fingers they have on one hand. Right. People who play dominoes or throw dice can actually see a, a figure for 12 pretty okay. easily. <laughs> seven trillion? I don't know anybody <laughs> who knows what seven trillion is. Three, it's three times, it's more rain than Hurricane Isaac and three yeah. times as much as Hurricane Katrina. Katrina. And wow. this was a storm, these it, mesoscale... This was really just a normal storm that kind of got... Right, a mesoscale uh, 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 convective system it comes from the clash of two bodies of air. One is cold and the other is hot. The hot air is very... Um, is very moisture laden usually. The cold air causes that moisture to just drop out and this can happen at any time of year in any part of the country and um, you know we've had them we had one come through Vermont a number of years ago where the winds were a hundred miles an hour and it came from the that west. That one went right through Wardsboro. Yeah. 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 We thought it was a tornado but they later it, said it was a downdraft. A, um, uh, what do they call those things? Well, I Micro... Um, Microburst? Burst, that's All right. All I can tell you, there was a 50-foot swath from the town of Stratton, which is not in Stratton Mountain, right. it's the back, to Wardsboro. Yeah. Where you could, you could, you could drive, practically drive a car through it. Yes. All the trees were down. All the trees are down. And that's, that's from air not going up like a tornado, but going but down. down. Yeah. And that is... Uh, weather is strange. <laughs> but, it, you know, Donald Trump says climate change is just weather. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. he, can, he can dream on. I just wish he'd dream on some other planet. 
Okay, so we'll move on to Friday. We will move on to Friday, September 9th, and our next item comes from Renew Economy. And it's Lion or Lyon? Lyon? Well, let me, yeah, let me get a... Lion, see. I would say Lion. <laughs> Lion yeah, it's Australia. It's they Australia. Call it. They don't know anything Lion about confirms Lyon. plans for two big solar plus storage plants in Australia. Solar plus storage, despite not... The coming have, thing. Yeah, and this is interesting. Despite not receiving funding from the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, large-scale solar funding f around... So uh, Lion Solar says it is committed to going ahead with the largest single large-scale solar and battery storage facility in the world in South Australia, along with a number of, uh, with similar solar plus storage plant in North Queensland. By the way, it's in North South Australia. It's in North South Australia. <laughs> okay, that's a good thing to remember. This is in North South Australia, which is... Well, South Australia is the name of a state. Yes. And this is the northern part of yeah, South so Australia. so it is, in fact, North South Australia. Right. So okay, it's going to... Uh, have you finished reading it? I have. Yeah. Yes. It, it's going to be a minimum 100 megawatts of solar PV. Right. Stored with 100 megawatt hours of battery storage. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how that translates to, a, to its load, but it's probably several days. It's... It's hard to know. It you is, know? really. It yeah. really is. A lot... A lot there's... It, uh, there's there's a lot of variation. What's going to be connected like if there's an outage? Yeah. We were talking at the ener at a small part of the the energy the I forget the yeah name the, of the thing. It was part of the it was an energy committee subcommittee. I wanted to go to that and I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was actually a good discussion. And I read we some were of, I re read some of the results. Yeah, yeah, and we were talking about the fact that Wyndham County has this four hundred thousand dollar. Um, thing that is being offered. Kind of a grant, isn't it's it? It's sort of, yeah, I guess it's a grant. And looking at the kinds of things that could, could be done with that. And one of the things that we were talking about was the idea of putting a battery at the uh, high school so that the solar pow power at the high school, which is 150 kilowatts, would be able to power a battery that would keep... Is that on the... Uh, what's his name? He just died. His... Oh... The shoe guy is that on his? I don't know. Land? I don't know. Don't know. What's his, what's the, I don't What's know. the name of the shoe guy? I don't remember. <laughs> I'm, Famillary. I'm very bad with yeah, names. Yeah, Jerry Famillary. Okay. He he but, owned a very large parcel. Yeah. Behind the school, mm -hmm. over by the, the throughway, and the lower part of that field, and you can't even see it unless you're looking for it. Is solar. Okay. I mean, well, I, the idea was if we had a battery there, then we wouldn't have to rely on diesel power to keep. The, the high school warm in an emergency. So if we had a, if it would form the basis for an emergency microgrid at the high school, which would mean and the that, high school could then be a place of assembly if there was some sort right. of right. Well, it is a it is an emergency yeah, system, yeah. but it would mean that we wouldn't you know in the event of a week long power outage, in which you could very easily run out of diesel power. Um, Oh sure. You could you'd have any you'd have a battery backup system that could power the heating system and emergency lights. Makes sense to me. Yeah. It's, it's anyway, a, it's, it's a relatively simple solution. This is similar to what what they are talking about for Queensland and uh, South Aust North South Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the art. This <clears throat> this is this sums it right up here. Battery storage really is the missing piece of the puzzle in Australia's clean energy future, and for that matter, anywhere seeking to incorporate large amounts of renewables into the energy mix. Right. The battery could ensure that the entire state does not face outages. Right. If the interconnector fails, the battery will instantaneously compensate. And when they say entire state, that what they mean is that parts of the state would have uh, power on an emergency basis. And so even though a person's home didn't have electrical power, the local... Well, it's very likely they would incorporate some form of load shedding yeah. so that the batteries lasted longer. They're right. not, not going to want to keep everybody's going electric heat going. Going yeah. And, yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it, it makes sense. Okay. So we are we on to the Burlington Free Press? We're back to... Uh, back we've got to, ZME Science in Oh, you're here. right. We do. ZME Science has this story. Tom, what's the China story? covered all its new energy demand with renewables in 2015, all of them. And oh. there was plenty left to spare. Yeah. China is drawing more and more power from renewables. In fact, new data collected by Greenpeace 
shows that in 2015, the country's growth in wind and solar energy more than exceeded its increase in electricity demand. And by the way, this is a country that is still putting in power for people who have never had it before. They have achieved power to every village in China, but they're still bringing that whole thing up where people who have never had power before are having increases in their power supply. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> kind of bringing them into the 21st century. Yes, exactly. Um, it pu putting this in perspective, China installed half of all the world's new solar and wind capacity last year. China is in has installed half of all wind and solar that was installed last year worldwide. Half of the world's... <laughs> yeah. Well, and putting this into perspective, there's yeah. a little takeaway here. The wind farms alone could have met half of the UK's needs in 2015. Yeah. Okay. According to the data, the 48 terawatt hours of solar power and wind China installed in 2015 alone could have powered two Irelands. Two Ireland. Yeah. Yeah, it would, it would have powered a mess of Vermonts, I think. I would think. I would yep. think. Okay. Are we up to Burlington Free Press? Back to Vermont? Uh, I got, yeah, I got the Burlington Free Press here. Okay. I got a picture coming up. Yes. What do we have from the Burlington Free Press? Wind power stirs Swanton's backyard. <laughs> <laughs> A wind power proposed proposal submitted to Vermont regulators includes an offer, offer to buy out close neighbors who object to the turbines, according to the consultants for the project. Property owners living within 3,000 feet of the Swanton Wind Project will have six months after the project goes online to take up the offer. So th they are going to be able to spend six months experiencing this, and if they don't like it, they can say, you got to buy us out. Well, the article talked about some of the people who are opposing it. Yeah. They're very, very vociferous. Yes. I mean, and mostly based on fear. Mostly based okay. on fear. Yeah, there's, there's <clears throat> one neighbor is unconvinced he'll be able to tolerate the turbine sound. I've heard it described as a brick wrapped in a towel rolling around in a barrel. Wump, 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 wump. <laughs> That's, I've heard them. I would not describe it like that. <laughs> hey, I live on... Elliott Street. Yeah. The traffic on Elliott Street is louder than the turbine noise at Searsburg. Oh. And I've a, measured both a, of them. A, a good deal louder. We're not louder. just talking my ears. We're talking about an instrument. Right. A good deal louder. I live on Elliott Street, and until my landlady put in um, rope caulk and <clears throat> window inserts in the windows, when cars went by at night, boom cars, the windows would rattle yeah. in, from the noise from the cars. Well, I love the motorcycles coming up Elm Street. Oh man! <laughs> and then oh. they hit it. They hit Elliot. They flatten out and zoom. Yep. <laughs> <clears throat> well, people live out in the countryside because they want to avoid such noises. So, well, it was, it was interesting that we're talking about these the people who are op opponents to this. Yep. Several of them are already on record by saying, "If it goes in, we're moving." Yeah. Okay. And they can, Why not? <clears throat> yep. especially since it's the developer yep. is going to make it easy for make it easy You want to move them. up by your house. Yeah, yeah. And apparently from reading about him, he could do it. He's been a very successful developer. Well. And he owns all the houses in the development, or he, <laughs> he built them all. He didn't own them. Oh, okay. You know, they're individually owned, but he built them all. And they all have a codicil in the, in the ownership paper that says, someday I might put wind towers up on that hill. Goody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'd buy into that. Actually, I would. You know, there. I used to live on a mountaintop in, in New Hampshire, uh -huh. and I was waked up by the sound of a diesel engine. Which was many miles away. It was, at, it was more than seven miles away. This yeah. was an engine that was coming straight at me, and it, as it came up the Connecticut River Valley, it would come into sight when it was seven and a half miles away, and I oh, could yeah. hear it could ten it, minutes yeah. before I could see it. And then the period that it took to traverse the three and a half miles of track I could see, yeah. um, it took about ten minutes. So I'm figuring that this thing was probably a little over ten miles away when it woke me up. Wow. Okay. And I also, at another point in my life, lived um, at Pratt Institute in a dormitory. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I was within a 150, 200 feet of the Myrtle Avenue L, mm -hmm. which went by every half hour all night long. Mm -hmm. 
And, and it uh, rattled like hell. And it rattled like hell. It was extremely noisy. The first three nights I was there, I barely slept. After that, you know, uh, it, everything was easy. Of course, there's By one... By the way, that was in Brooklyn, wasn't that it? That was in Brooklyn. It's the Moidle Avenue M L. Moidle Avenue L. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, we were at Pratt Institute. It was the Myrtle Avenue L. All I had to do in order to tolerate that sound was fall in love. It was the easiest thing in the world. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should we keep going? Yeah, we're, we're okay. going to stay in Vermont this time. We're going to stay in Vermont. So we're up to a story on Saturday, September 10th, and this Gra is from VT Digger. Yeah, Grafton, not, Grafton likely not ready for the critical turbine vote. There you go. <clears throat> Developer Iberdrola Renewables has said it will abide by the results of a November vote by residents in the Vermont towns of Wyndham and Grafton on whether a 28 turbine project should proceed. However, town officials say town residents will have all information they need by election day. Well, you missed, you, you well, got it wrong. Ooh, you missed town the word officials not. will say town residents will have, will not have, not have all the information they need by election day. The wind farm uh, would be the state's largest. And so um, this is, well, you go ahead. You've got a, well, the, the, the reason for the for them not being ready is that the town plan is being revised. Yep. Okay, and that's not ready yep. for for a vote, and that has they want that to be done before they before vote. Before they vote, which sort of makes sense. Yep. It's absolutely necessary to have the town plan in place before we vote. Yeah. Iberdrola, in turn, says a postponed vote seems to be a delay tactic designed to lower turnout. Oh, well, you can see why they'd feel that way. Does the select board think as many people will show up to vote during the holiday season as they would on election day? My bet that a lot of people would vote for this one and the, that the overwhelming vote would be against it. That's my bet. I think you're right. I think you're right. I might be wrong about no, that. No, I, I think that's, that's my prediction. Yeah. Too. There's a small number of extremely vocal people, and including the, select, mo the majority of the select board in both of these towns that are again this. Yeah. Now, both you and I have been up there. Yeah. It's hardly a pristine ridge. <laughs> hardly <laughs> I mean, a pristine ridge. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's uh, transmission lines going up and down the ridge. Well, not only that, but it was clear cut, not and all It was clear long. cut, yeah. The, I mean, the previous owner. So it's not, owner it's before not the, virgin forest that no, they're, they're going is, to be destroying there. This is uh, really kind and of There's roads in there. You can drive up there. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's they're, really they're making a lot of... To, a do over nothing. Really. Yes. Well, they're worried about sound, but you know, honestly, be, as we've said well, before. Well, until you've experienced it, you're, I would be likely to think it's much louder I've, than I've it was. I've talked many times about, the, about calling people at various places in the United States looking for people who live yeah. in wind yeah. farms. Yeah. And I found lots of people who live in wind farms. I did not find anybody who lived in a wind farm who found it a, a, a worrisome or bothersome experience. Everybody was pro-wind. It's that I easy to. to imagine it when you haven't experienced it. It really is. Yeah, but you know, the, the woman I talked to who was in the Roscoe wind farm, I called up, uh, you know, and these, these were people who were randomly chosen from yeah. public, you know, like the library. The, you, you say, okay, find a big wind farm, look up the towns that are in it, look for the library, the municipal building, the, yeah. the chamber of commerce, whatever. Talk to whoever answers the phone, not somebody important. They might have an ax to grind. I said to this woman, could you tell me how it feels to live in a wind farm? Now, just so everybody knows, Roscoe is a town of 1,600 people. And it is in the middle of a wind farm with 634 turbines. 634 That's turbines. That's right. <laughs> That's a wind farm. <laughs> That's a wind farm. And she said, oh, I've never thought about the fact that we live in a wind farm. I suppose we do. <laughs> well, we like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. You know, well, it keeps the taxes down and employs people. What do you want? You know? Well, it's, it's far... Lower, less of a bugaboo once you've experienced once it. Once you've experienced it, yeah. It's, but there are like people said, out there who want to make sure you don't experience it. It's easy to get scared because you don't know what it is. Yeah, well, and conspiracy theories are easy to make up, too. Okay, are we up to South Coast today? This is from... Yeah, we are. we got a nice picture coming still, up here. Still from September 10th. This is, uh, that's New Bedf. New Bedf. Okay. Okay, energy VIPs tout New Bedford's wind industry. 
The city of New Bedford is highlighted as two cabinet members released a national survey for offshore wind development while touring a turbine testing facility in Charlestown, capping a month-long period launching the renewable energy industry in America, Massachusetts, and the South Coast. I used to live on the South Coast. Yeah, you did, didn't yeah, you? I yeah, I did. Yeah. Yep. Well, there's, there's something going on here. I've mentioned it already. Uh, the state built a marine commerce terminal in New Bedford. Right. And it was a lot of criticism because it had no purpose. Yes. <laughs> they were going to say they weren't going weren't to get any customers. Yeah. And all of a sudden, as it turns out, it's in exactly the right place. It has exactly the right facilities yep. to be a headquarters for the development of wind power How off the South that? Coast. And just at I the moment... It, I don't think it was planned. Just at the moment that Massachusetts passed a law yeah. saying that they need to have 1,800 megawatts I think megawatts these things just power. fell into place. I so believe they, they did. If they planned it, they I did believe, a beautiful job. Yeah, I, believe that, I believe that's exactly what happened. I think it just happened. fell into place. This, by the way, is um, from southcoasttoday.com. Our next item is from Microgrid Media. Okay, electrical manufacturers lay out microgrid strategic vision. Now, this is, this is an important thing because yeah. microgrids are going to be important. They're in going the to future. become more important. The National Electric Manufacturing Association laid out in a strategic vision for microgrid development and use for the 21st century in um, a, a publication called Powering Microgrids for the 21st Century Electrical System. It says microgrids will make a transition from off-grid island systems to integral parts of a broader-based grid of broader-based grid networks. And this it was this was the article where they were talking about grids within grids. Is that is that right? That's a different article. That's a different article. Yeah, okay. but it's it's not exactly the same. They're, they're basically, what they're saying is we're moving to a situation where the, the grid paradigm is going to be changed. Absolutely. And the grid, paradigm, the grid paradigm looks like a tree that strings out its branches from, a, from its roots and they, they go out to the individual homes and businesses. Yeah. And that, that root structure then has energy coming in from, from big transmission lines that go to a power plant. And what they're talking about is a system that makes it put, instead of having a big power plant miles away, you have little power plants all over the place. Exactly. And those little power plants are non-polluting. They certainly can a be. A lot of them, a lot of them mm -hmm. are going to be solar people mm -hmm. on people's rooftops. Mm -hmm. But the point is, when the, when the overall grid goes down, such as it has on many occasions where mm -hmm. the entire Northeast is without power, those little grids just keep going. Mm -hmm. So people have so power. So people locally still have power. That's right. And that's what we were just talking about, you know, the idea of putting a battery at the high school for. Exactly. Okay. Well, a quick takeaway here is, once viewed as, we're talking about microgrids now. Yeah. Because microgrids have been around for a long time. They, every ship at sea has its own is microgrid. A microgrid. Yeah. College campuses are microgrids. Yes. Sometimes hospitals are microgrids. NYU had a microgrid at, during Sandy. It, it kept going, and the rest of New York City was out and, of power. And, and right here in Bar Brattleboro, the retreat has a microgrid. The tr retreat has a microgrid. Among other things. And the hospital has a microgrid. So once it. viewed as islanded, islanded systems of generation and load, valued mostly for the ability to disconnect to disconnect from the grid and serve individual customer facilities during outages. This report explains how and why they are now seen as a part of distribution system operations. Interacting with the distributed grid through advanced control and distribution management systems. So there's going to be computer controls of yeah, all well, this Computer stuff. control is very you're important. You're going to see a grid of grids. Yeah. It's going to be a it's network going to be a grid rather of than grids. a tree. That's right. Yeah. And this little computer that I've got, you can see it there, has about 20,000 times as much memory and power and so forth as the first computer I had. Yeah, you're totally, that's and amazing. Like, and that's... $150. I saw an ad for a thumb drive <clears throat> that had 250 megs. <laughs> it was something like 150 bucks, but it was a thumb drive. I was talking to a woman <laughs> who was sitting next to me at the Restless Rooster for yeah. breakfast and... and I, you know, she said something about our computer. I said, "How much memory does that shit have?" And she said, "Well, it's got, it's got a, a terabyte drive." And I said, "You know, the first computer I worked with that would have cost three point two trillion dollars." 
You could have bought the entire state of New York with that. So. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're up to Sunday, Sunday, September 11th, and we've got an item from Think Geo Energy. Yeah, we've got a picture here. With my go. bad vision, I look at this, and I thought it said, right. Think Goo Energy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very interesting picture. That's, that is a geothermal power plant yeah, in it's Thailand. It's a small one. But it's a small one. Yeah. That is the Fang. That's in Fang, yeah. Yeah, Fang Geothermal um, there's, a, you know, there's a, a woman. Who, there's a woman who's a reporter from San Francisco who came to Brattleboro to talk to people about Vermont Yankee when the, when it was still open and there was okay. a movement. And her name was Serene Fang. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "That's a name I'm not going to forget." And she said, "Yeah, my parents. <laughs> what were they thinking?" <laughs> but anyway, okay. Fang geothermal plant in Chiang Mai. Yes, Thailand. model. For more to come in Thailand? Yeah, Th Thailand has been seeking to... I've been to, to Chiang Mai. It's a resort town. Really? Nice beaches, yeah. Thailand has been seeking to diversify its currently fossil fuel-based power generation towards more renewable energy power generation. Geothermal is one of the available options, and local TV stations carried some footage covering geothermal plant in the province of Chiang Mai in northern Thailand. And you this can see that footage if you want to go on a web. Yeah. There's a link to it. It's, this it's is not worth doing it, though. <laughs> Just a picture of this thing so, yeah. with a moving camera. Okay. <laughs> it's, but it is in uh, September 11th, so if you go to geoharvey.com, you can see, you know, see geo energy. Okay. Well, apparently northern Thailand has a lot of low-energy geothermal. Yes. And the takeaway from this is they're planning to put up a whole bunch of these little things. Yep. I forgot how many megawatts it's got. I don't think it has megawatts. I don't have that number. It's, it's, but it's it, not very big. <clears throat> it's not very big, but it's designed to supply power to a local village. Yeah, and it will do it. Yep. We've got we've to press on because we've got a lot more stuff here to do in the next 20 another, minutes. Another, another pitch out I, Our next item comes from Grist. Oh, look at that. Go. Isn't it restful looking? Obama administration's offshore wind pl plan would power 23 million homes. The vision of the federal government unveiled on Friday calls for wind farms off nearly every U.S. coastline. And by the way, that includes many areas in the, um, the Great, Lakes. Great Lakes. Yeah, <clears throat> Might even include Lake Champlain for all I know. I don't know. Well, New York State's got a lot of wind uh, right bordering Champlain. Yeah. In an effort to generate 86 gigawatts of electricity from offshore wind through zero carbon power from more than uh, 20 power for more than 23 million homes. Offshore wind is a major part of US strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's the equivalent I'm going to say of about um, 43 nuclear power mid-sized nuclear power plants. That's a lot. You That's take it into account the intermittent yeah. nature yeah. of wind. Okay. And, and, the, and the high capacity yeah. factor of, yeah. of, of offshore wind, which in some cases now we've got offshore wind turbines that are delivering capacity factors that are approximately equal to some um, uh, combined cycle natural gas plants. These things are getting very, very good at at Well, there are uh, some places power. where there's a lot of wind. There's a lot of wind in some places. You heard of the trade winds, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, we're up to Monday, September 12th, and we've got an item from Bloomberg. Another picture here. Yeah, we do. This Beginning is, of the end for fossil power. This is amazing. This is absolutely, there was another thing that was amazing too, the prospectus, uh, but this is, this is really kind of incredible. Just so that people will understand what's going on here. Uh, a prospectus of this type is used by a company that is issuing uh, stock in an, in, in an initial public offering. They are trying They're to looking for investors. In, attract investors, but they have to tell the truth. Yeah. The law says they have to tell the truth. Oh, so that makes them tell the yeah. truth. Yeah. Well, but they don't always tell the truth. They, they don't want to get caught on this one. <laughs> E.ON is, is one of the largest utilities in the world. It's That's just the name of the company. Yeah. I couldn't figure out what it means. It, yeah. it, apparently, it's just E.ON. It's just E.ON. It's the largest utility in Germany, and it's all it's over the very, world. very, very large very big. conglomerate utility okay. that operates in a they lot of countries. They have spun countries. off a second company. Um, which is taking all of their nuclear and fossil fuel generating okay. capacity. It's kind of isolating it. 
yes, they're, they're, they're saying, we want to be renewable, we're going to get rid of all of this stuff. And so they still own it right now, but it's probably for well, sale. Well, it it, it, they had their initial public offering. Okay. So that means that investors have come in and bought large parts oh, okay. of it. It's, okay, it's for sale on the stock market. That's right, yeah, and they yeah, can yeah. dump the rest of it that they've got yeah. by selling it on the stock market. They don't own a controlling interest in it anymore. The prospectus of E.ON's conventional generation spinoff says, quote, conventional generation of power faces the risk of losing competitiveness against renewable energy and thus market share, and over the long term even faces the risk of disappearing completely from the market. This, that again, I didn't hear <laughs> this is from a company <laughs> which is trying to sell itself as a generator of conventional electricity, yeah. and they want you to buy the stock. Conventional generation of power faces the risk of losing competitiveness against renewable energy and thus market share, and over the long term, even faces the risk of disappearing completely from the market. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, our business is going to shrink until it disappears. Isn't that a great thing to invest in? <laughs> <laughs> well, the backstory is that Eon yeah. has been losing money. On these facilities. Yeah, yeah. They, they've been losing money big time. Yeah. The article referred to red ink. Yeah. Okay. And they've yeah. got to get rid of this. And, you know, they're just hoping that people will take it off their hands and milk that thing for whatever uh, dividends they can get for as long as it lasts, and then it'll go out of business. Then they're gone. Yeah. yeah. It's not their problem anymore. Our next item is from the WatertownDailyTimes.com. Yeah, we don't have any picture there. No, we don't. Okay, feeling the heat. Downstate legislators aren't keen on subsidies for upstate nukes. Well, how about that? Some downstate New York lawmakers don't like the fact that their constituents must now subsidize energy produced at nuclear power plants in upstate regions. The legislators take issue with the State Public Service Commission's decision to include subsidies for nuclear power in the clean energy standard approved in August. They but what they're like saying it. is the downstate isn't using that power. Yeah, why should, why should they subsidize away. it? Why should they subsidize yeah, it? Yeah, that's you their know. point. Yeah. Of course, they are using power from uh, Solar. Indian Point. And the, the energy said, you know, if you can include Indian Point in these subsidies, <laughs> yeah, we'll right. support it. Got, it. It, got stuck, it, oh, it got man. stuck into that mix. Nuclear it? power is too expensive. I'm sorry. It's just too expensive. Okay. Our next item is from CNN. And yeah, we this have, is an interesting one. We have a picture here. Yeah, let's bring her up. Yeah, let's bring her up. That is a soccer mom. Meet the mom litigating the biggest case on the planet. Biggest case? This is a lawyer, ladies and gentlemen. This is a lawyer who is litigating an important case. This is an opinion piece. Julia Olson is litigating what should be considered one of the most important court cases in the United States. She's helping 21 kids, as young as the age of nine, sue the Obama administration over its insufficient action on climate change. Olson will attempt to make their case for the future. We've talked about this already. We, uh, this about and that. other cases. There's, yeah. there, there are other people who are doing things that are similar. And here's the point. She, Olson will argue that the federal government, by failing to adequately regulate greenhouse gas pollution, and by continuing to lease new federal lands and waters for fossil fuels, is violating the kids' constitutional right to life, it liberty, and It would be property. really interesting to see the Supreme Court uphold this thing because it would mean that, it would mean that the, the fossil fuels industry would not be able to expand. It they're, would not be able to go into new They're going to be areas. under tremendous pressure to dump this one, I think. I think <laughs> they are, but you know, sometimes the Supreme Court surprises people. So our next item is from WAAY. Nevada Energy Company submits a $38 million bid for the Belafonte nuclear power plant. Now, this, I want to point out to anybody who really cares that we've got, anybody who's got more than $38 million could put in a, a bid for, of it for himself on this nuclear plant that the, fed, that the government... Well, yeah, it's, right. it's not work. The, the plant isn't finished. No, the plant isn't working. Just, just a little shy of finished, folks. Phoenix Energy, an alternative energy, alternative energy company from Nevada, is bid, bidding 
38 million dollars for the unfinished Belafonte nuclear plant in Hollywood, Alabama. The Tennessee Valley Authority has invested five billion, I, I just said four, I was wrong, in the plant since construction began in the mid-1970s, but it was never finished as demand leveled off and they couldn't figure out what to do with its electricity. Well, the article says Phoenix Energy says it wants to produce electricity using a new method at the plant, but they don't disclose they don't what, disclose that, new what method that is. is. Yeah. And this is what they're bidding on. 1,600 acres of land on the Tennessee River. Two unfinished reactors, power lines, a warehouse, office buildings, roads, and a thousand space parking lot. How about that? So, you know... I'll bet that parking lot has cracks in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's an interesting concept, though. Yeah, it is. It'll be interesting to see what they're going to do with that. Our next item is from mystatesman.com. Okay, and this is the Fayette coal plant is a money loser. Wow. And where's, Austin, where's Fayette? Lower Colorado. Well, huh? it's, this is Austin Energy. It, I believe it is Lower Colorado, yeah. Austin Energy's part, partial ownership of a coal-fired power plant might cost the utility $10 million a year, a report says. The analysis commissioned by Public Citizen found that dramatic expanses of wind and solar generation combined with rock bottom prices for natu natural gas had ruined the economics of most coal plants. Interesting. Is, yeah. So they want to dump it. They want to dump it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's move along. We're right up to now. Wednesday, to September day. 14th. That's and we've got yesterday. That was nine birthday. minutes to do three items. Okay, this is from echobusiness.com. Seven charts show new renewables outpacing the rising demand for the first time. Yeah, the, this is another one of those those articles you might very well want to uh, yeah. look up because there's seven of these charts. There's We're only seven going to of these talk charts. about one. This, this chart is interesting, you know, because you see a, you see a drop off and it, clearly it's not just the United States. I mean this this isn't caused by the Obama administration. This is this is a worldwide thing. But the United States is <clears> the one on top. It's a very interesting graph. Well, North graph. America. It's a very interesting graph. What has happened here is oil and gas investment. This is investment in finding new oil fields, developing new oil fields, building new refineries and stuff of that nature. That's what they call upstream costs. Right. In investment. Well, yeah. And what are we built, what are we spending money on now for the future right yeah. and what that what it, what this shows is that uh, the investments have dropped by about 50% in the last 3 or 4 years and that is mostly because of a drop in the price of oil because yeah, it is yeah but i want to point out something here and that is even with what we call a low price of oil this investment is about 3 times what it was in 2000 so when, the, when they started fracking and found all this oil and gas, it was a message to investors, there's yeah. money to be made. I think what we're seeing here is peak oil. Yeah. And we started hitting peak oil in 1970. Yeah, we hit a second peak. And we've, we've, been, we've been kind of finding new ways yeah. to get oil yeah. cheap and finding Well, it's not cheap though. Yeah, it's not cheap, but but we. This is what peak oil has been. It's been a, it's been a, a bunch of ups and downs of finding mm -hmm. new oil and then using it up and finding new oil. Mm -hmm. And the finding new oil has switched from initially from finding where it was to finding a new way to get it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what has happened is, we've we've had a bunch of market conditions where it's become more and more obvious that the price of oil is not just related to demand and supply of oil. Not anymore. Not anymore, because it's being hit, and yeah. this is also true of natural gas, because it's being hit by renewable power. Yep. And Which so they never anticipated. They, they did not anticipate. And so the peak oil is looking very different than a lot of people thought. And yeah. I remember talking yeah. with guys I went to college with when I was in college about peak oil. This is like 1967. Wow, you were ahead of the game, weren't well, you? Well, I mean, you got to remember that the Rome Report came, the, uh, the report of, Rome. of the yeah, yeah, Club yeah. of Rome came out about that time, and they talked about it at length. And that report that they came up with, it was just plain scary. They said, we were going to be out of oil by 1995 or something. I forget what the date was. But they all expected that the price would just go up and up and up and up and up up and a friend of mine looked at what you know heard what we were saying and he said 
you, you know, there's enough shale oil in North America to keep us going for 400 years. The problem is it's too expensive to extract. Mm -hmm. When we get to that point, the co it's going to be extracted. Well, I got a quick takeaway on these seven graphs, though. Okay. Uh, the first graph showed us that energy investment is down. Yeah. The to second overall as energy investment. Yeah. Yeah. The second one they call the oil slide. It's falling investment in oil and gas. Yeah. And there has been cheap oil because yeah. that's why there's falling in investment. Yep. Third one is falling costs. I didn't realize this, but two thirds of the fall in oil and gas investment has been absorbed by cost reductions. Okay. It's cheaper to do it. Yeah. Power shift. Remo renewables are up and fossil fuels are down. Right. They didn't anticipate that one. Yes. Investment map. It's con the, the, these uh, changes in investment are concentrated in China and in the Asian right. countries. Okay, China's stranding. Much of the surge in Chinese coal capacity is unnecessary. Yeah. Okay, and the last one is the climate is inconsistent. Spending on low carbon will need to increase rapidly over the years ahead right. for climate destabilization. Right. right. So all of these are coming together. They're all coming. This is a perfect storm for the oil and gas industry that is yet to hit in full fury. That's a good analysis of yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, we should get on to business standard. Do we have any more on that one? No, like, well, that's, that's enough. <laughs> okay, it's enough. <laughs> yeah, this we get this two more item from yeah. business standard is going to be pretty quick to dispatch because well, it's Well, it's on simple. the same subject. Yeah. Energy investment falling with flows signaling a move toward cleaner energy. Yep. According to the International Energy Agency, which gives details on detailed analysis of investment across the global energy system, global energy investment fell by 8% in 2015 with a drop in oil and gas spending outweighing continued robust investment in renewable and uh, electric electricity networks and energy efficiency so renewable power and energy efficiency spending is going up but overall spending is going down eight percent in 2015 because the fossil fuels industry is not getting as much investment and there you can see it on that graph that we've got on the screen it's right and it's there. happening in different ways in different parts of the world. Yeah. U.S. energy spending is going down. West Asia and Russia is spending less, but not as bad. Yeah. Yeah. And we should get on to this last we issue. We got the item. last one. We've we got, got three minutes. Three minutes. We can do it. In okay, three we can do it. Vermont Public Radio had this. Tad Montgomery was at this, and he gave me a rundown on what happened there. Oh yeah. 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 To fill a void left by Vermont Yankee. Vernon looks for new energy projects. Yeah, I had wanted to go to that. Yeah. I don't know what happened. I, 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 didn't go. I, I was going to go with Tad, and I wasn't able to make it. Energy leaders from across Vermont met in Vernon this week to help the town plan for life after Vermont Yankee. Energy Corporation closed VY in December of 2014, leaving behind an enormous switchyard which can handle hundreds of megawatts of electricity from a power plant. The town wants to use that for tax base. There's lots of ideas about what to do with Vermont it's, it's a plan. Plant. It's a great big thing sitting there, and somebody's saying, we can use that. We what can use can that. What can we do? Exactly. And it could be energy coming in. Or energy going or out. Or energy going yeah. out. So if but Google you've wanted heard to... You've me saying that. Yeah. You've talked about the energy coming in. You was putting in a... a uh, Computer a computer uh, data center. Data center. It would be a, it would be a good site for data. This is the way I described it. There's an open position. There's an empty socket that you can plug something in. So yep. Vernon is trying to figure out what to plug in that socket. <laughs> yes, and they had a lot of ideas that were. Yeah, I read a bunch of them, and uh, you they're know, doing their thinking. They're doing their thinking. It's going to something be will happen. I something mean, it's, will happen. There is an empty well, socket something. there. Yes, and that's that's expensive. That is a, an asset that somebody could use. It's going to cost which money. Would cost money to develop. I think the Google um, uh, uh, data center probably won't go there because the price of electricity in in the area is rather high. Probably compared. high. Yeah. The, the, the electricity mean, has to be cheap. These data centers can be all over the they place. They can be anywhere. And you know, I, I, Iceland is a home to a lot of data centers because the electric power there is They're cheap. So and, cheap. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, that's what that is. And in the U.S., there are a lot of them in Oregon and Washington. Yeah. Tad was um, try, hoping to be able to get people to talk about uh, energy amplifiers. Okay. And if anybody wants to know about energy amplifiers, we've actually done two shows. You could go to brattleboro.tv.org, do a search on 
If you searched energy amplifier, would it come up? Energy amplifier, I believe it comes up. The energy amplifier will use uh, spent nuclear fuel, almost 100% of it, to make electricity. There's That's enough a great to, thing. Yeah, there's enough of it down there that to keep it. That solves two up. problems. Yep. Keep a plant. And it can't run away. Yeah. I mean, it's a safe, pretty much there's, a safe There's plant. a lot to say about this. We should sign off. So I'm going to say good, good night. Tom, you can say good night, too. I will say good night as we well. We should wave goodbye. Gentle rains can fall upon the land So lovely earth can stay lovely still